Uh, speaking of children, uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, Jesus' early life and kind of the things that were important marks on his early life and how these things are important for us to be able to recognize how much it is that God values us. Uh, for, you know, if God didn't care about us, if he didn't really give much thought to us, of course, Jesus and his coming to us would be absurd. Uh, but Jesus did come. Jesus did come in the flesh, God in human flesh, and he did dwell among us, as the Gospel of John says. Uh, now, the, the Gospel that gives us the most detail about uh, Jesus' early life is actually the Gospel of Luke, but we're in the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll focus on what Matthew says. But uh, what we want to focus on today is kind of our big idea is that the marks of Jesus' early life discussed here serve to confirm First of all, his identity and our need for his mission. Okay, the marks of Jesus' life, some of these kind of fantastic things that happened in the early life of Jesus confirm who the Bible says he is and, of course, our need for his mission that he came to perform, which was to draw us to himself and to save us and to make us his people. So, those are the, so that's why we're going to be focusing on some of the things that uh, are marks of Jesus' very early life when he was still a child and still growing up and uh, just kind of returning. So we've, we've looked at, obviously, the birth of Christ. We've looked at uh, the, the wise men and how they came and presented gifts, and they were all kingly gifts, kind of marking out his kingliness and telling us how important he is in that regard, and then how he was perceived as a threat by those who were in power, particularly Herod the Great, and how Herod uh, was trying to slaughter him and, and put him to death. And when he realized that the wise men had tricked him and uh, it was pretty upset about that, he slaughtered all of the male children in Bethlehem, two years old and under, in an attempt to snuff out the light that was the, the child Jesus Christ. And how he failed at that because Joseph had been warned in a dream to flee to Egypt. And now uh, we're kind of coming full full circle on the, the end of this portion and looking at uh, the, the kind of the concluding remarks on Jesus' early life in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your sermon notes, which is one of the only things you got as you walked in today, uh, your very first fill in the blank is this, Jesus' early life is marked by angelic guidance and preservation. Jesus' early life is first marked by angelic guidance angels, guidance, and preservation. Now, this is something that we've seen a few times already, right? We've seen a few times already how uh, an angel first comes to announce the birth of Jesus, how an angel appears to Joseph in a dream and says, this is what's going to happen. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, or what is uh, conceived in her is, uh, is of the Holy Spirit, and you will call his name Jesus. He's going to save his people. So angelic announcement, and then and, 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 and the same angel probably comes and says, Herod is after this child. Take this child. Flee to Egypt to preserve his life. And then now what we're going to see is the angel is going to show up one more time. But Jesus' early life is marked by angelic guidance and preservation. Angelic guidance and preservation. Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. All right, so coming back at the beginning of this, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord. Now, kind of an important point here. Even in the Bible, even in Bible times, you do not casually run into angels. 
right? They don't just show themselves all of the time. They only show up when something big is going on or something important is about to happen or they have a very important message. You do not just casually run into angels. You know, you're not out shopping at Walmart or something and you turn the corner in the produce aisle and oh, there's an angel. of. You don't see that in our world. You didn't see that in their world. Okay, the only times that we know for sure that angels show up is the times that the scripture has recorded it. Okay, there might have been other angelic appearances, but probably that's more of a rarity than anything, than, than the opposite, where, where you don't have angels. Uh, they appear when God is up to something important. The work of God not the appearance of the angel, though, is what's important here. Sometimes we can get hung up, and sometimes we can get, get stuck on a detail and go, oh, this is about an angel. Actually, no, it's not about the angel. The angel is incidental to the main point. The main point is what God is doing, not that there's an angel who shows up to tell us about it. The angel marks the importance of it. The angel is not the important part himself. Okay? Angels are cool. I had a, anybody else have a phase where you sort of were really interested in angels? Right? And you're like, what are these things? What are these strange creatures that show up in the Bible? And then you go on a hunt through the Bible and you begin looking them up. And then you run into some truly weird passages. Okay? By the, especially by the time you get to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in the Bible, you get some funky angel stuff in that book. Right? And the descriptions of them are, well, there's, they have these many wings and they're covered with eyes. And you're like, what is going on here? I don't understand. And, and the kind of the, like, they're meant to be otherworldly. But we have to also understand that they are, they're never the point of any passage that they appear in. They're always meant to be signposts pointing us to God. So if you were ever to have a moment where you were out shopping and you did turn the, the aisle in the produce section and you did come face to face with an angel, you would initially be floored because every time an angel appears in the Bible, they have to tell the people that they run into, don't be afraid, because apparently they're terrifying, right? But once you get over that initial shock, right, just like the people in the Bible do, you pay attention to what the angel has to say, because the point of the angel's appearance is, by the way, God is up to something big. He's up to something very important. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared and began to tell Joseph, it's time to return. It's time to go back. It's time because the people who sought the, the life of the, the, your child, they're dead. Now, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. God previously communicated to prophets in dreams sometimes. Uh, note that the Old Testament figure, Joseph, had dreams as a prominent portion of his life. Okay? Joseph, however, was an interpreter of dreams. So, uh, you know, when Joseph is thrown into the, the jail in Genesis, uh, and he's there for probably a few years, and a couple of guys from Pharaoh's court get put in, and he interprets dreams for them. One of them is pretty good. The guy's going to get restored. The other one's not so good. The guy's going to get executed, right? And then the guy that gets released, years go by some more, and he, you know, eventually Pharaoh has a really weird dream that he doesn't know what to do with. And this guy remembers, he says, well, there's this Joseph guy, and he interpreted my dream, and it turned out to be true. You might want to talk to him, and <laughs> I know right where to find him, because he's in jail, and you can't, he can't go anywhere. And so that whole thing happens. They release Joseph. Joseph interprets the dreams. Now fast forward to the New Testament. The next Joseph we meet, he's encountering dreams himself now. Fortunately, they don't need a whole lot of interpretation because they're fairly straightforward. 
So the Old Testament Joseph is an interpreter of dreams, and this is the third dream that the New Testament Joseph has received in warning. This is the third time Joseph has received a dream in warning where an angel appears to him and says, this is what's going on. And there's one more coming. So there's one more coming. And he says, all right, you know, you're in Egypt. You don't have to stay here anymore. Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the life of the child are dead. Go to the land of Israel. Now that the immediate threat of Herod is gone, the angel shows up to guide Joseph to go back and to begin life in the land of the people of Israel and to, to get things going and to get the life of Israel's Savior going. So angelic guidance and preservation mark the early life of Jesus. Angelic guidance and preservation mark the early life of our Lord and Savior. And that is one of those keys or one of those signals or flags that tell us that this is not just an ordinary child. Okay? Not just an ordinary child. All sorts of strange things surround him and indicate for us that there's something beyond the normal, beyond the, the typical that's going on in this child's life. Number two, Jesus' early life is marked by regular danger. Jesus' early life is marked by regular danger. There never has been a baby who's been in more danger than our Lord and Savior, more threat to his life. He's just always in danger. Matthew 2, verses 21 through 22. It's Joseph. And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. All right, so we have this, uh, this bit here about... So he was already all set to go. He was going to kind of settle back where he felt he belonged. And they were going to go to kind of the, the same area where they had been before, the Bethlehem area. And that's where they're probably planning to go. Because they, you know, probably in the mindset of all of this strange stuff about the birth happened here. Apparently we're supposed to stay here. When the wise men show up, we, we remarked about the fact that it is probably sometime later after the birth because it says when the wise men came to the house, they're not in the stable anymore. They're in a house, right? And it says the child. It doesn't say the baby. It's a reference to a slightly older child, maybe one to two years old. So they had originally settled probably in Bethlehem. And it looks like that's in Joseph's mind to go there. But it says, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he decided that that was a bad idea. And then he was warned in a dream. So Archelaus was reigning and he was afraid to go there. Archelaus was reigning and he was afraid to go there. After Herod died, he was replaced by his son Archelaus. And Archelaus was not a nice guy. Archelaus was actually a pretty brutal, just kind of like a lot like his dad. He was a fairly angry kind of type, and he didn't like to put up with a whole lot of nonsense. So one of the things he did, for example, was he thought it would be a really good idea to put up a golden eagle statue on the Jewish temple. Jewish people kind of having a prohibition against idols, right? Remember the Ten Commandments? Don't make any graven images, right? They don't like that sort of thing. They were a bit upset about that. And so at night, two teachers and a bunch of their students got together and ripped the thing down. Well, by the time Archelaus figured out who had done that, he took them and he gathered them together and he slaughtered them in the temple and he burned them. Not a nice guy. Not a nice guy. And pretty much ever after that point, he's got people trying to appeal to Caesar Who's the guy, the main guy in charge, right? To get this guy gone, to get him out of there. And he actually lasts about nine years. 
He's finally, eventually, himself removed from office by Rome and banished, and he cannot return. And he's, he's told, you get out of here, don't you come back, or we'll kill you. Because his, his whole career as, as the, he's not allowed to be king at any point, actually. The, the best he's given is ethnarch. And an ethnarch is a ruler of ethnic people. It's like, well, you're not king, but you can kind of be in charge of the Jews. Sort of. And that doesn't sit well with him either. And he's not very happy about that. So that aggravates him and it makes his rule all the more brutal. And so eventually they're like, we got to get rid of this guy. So when, this is why when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in his place, he was afraid to go there because he knows Archelaus by reputation. He's just as bad as his dad was. The only thing that he's got going for him at this point is it doesn't appear that Archelaus has any idea that anybody might have survived the slaughter of his father, Herod. But it's just too much of a risk. So he says, all right, we don't want to go there. Then he gets warned in a dream, another dream. He's warned in a dream to withdraw to the district of Galilee. So he withdrew to the district of Galilee. In the midst of danger, God preserves him. Once again, God preserves the child. In the midst of danger, something is going on, and God is moving the pieces so that this child, this baby Jesus, this very young child, probably maybe a toddler at this point, okay, He's being preserved by God this whole time. He always seems to be in the midst of danger. And that, I mean, obviously, uh, that doesn't come to a conclusion. Because when we meet Jesus again as an adult, it does not take long for people to be upset with him and for people to want to get rid of him and for people eventually even to want to kill him. And that, of course, is what happens. His, his entire life, beginning from very early childhood, is marked by extreme danger. By extreme danger. So he pers God preserves his plan. Likewise, believers have the promise of preservation. Now, when I say believers have the promise of preservation, what I don't want you to hear on that is I don't want you to hear life is going to be fine. All things are going to go swell. You're going to have an easy, you know, that's not what we mean by preservation. Here's the preservation that God promises. You may face danger. You may face difficult things. You may face hardship. You may face pain. You may face hurt. You might even face death. Here, big secret. We're all going to face death. Okay? Maybe you didn't. I hate to spoil it for you. Eventually, that's where we're all headed. But the reality is, is that standing behind our lives and standing behind the most dangerous moments that we face, and everybody kind of has varying degrees. Have you ever felt like your life was at threat? Like, like ooh, this could be it. Have you ever had one of those moments? Those are good times, right? When maybe you're driving somewhere and the car begins slipping and ooh, there's a cliff. I was driving with my brother. We were on vacation in New York, and he had just gotten his driver's license. And he was a bit fast. Okay? Let's just put it that way. And we're driving, and uh, it's myself, my brother, and our, our younger cousin in the car. We were going from one place to another. Which, what you do in a car. And we, we were kind of going on this kind of country road, upstate New York, and there's this huge drop off kind of to the side of us. And uh, my brother takes this corner, but he takes it a little too hard. And the car begins to turn. And, and we end up facing completely the opposite direction. And we're going you know, kind of back where we came from. And we're all uh, shaken, uh, as you say. Because, I mean, we could have totally plummeted over that drop. That would have been the end of us because we were in my brother's convertible. Okay, Not a whole lot of support up there, right? So big kind of a dangerous moment. I'm still probably Gabriel's age, maybe a little bit older than my son Gabriel. So probably my brother 16. So I would have been 13 or 14 at the time. But I thought that was it. I thought, oh, this is how it ends. Right? 
this, this feeling of threat. But regardless of any feeling of threat, regardless of any feeling of danger, regardless of any pain, any suffering, every whatsoever we go through, we have a promise from our God of a kind of preservation that cannot be overcome. And that preservation is Jesus was killed, but he was raised from the dead. And those who have their faith in Christ are promised a participation in the resurrection. You may go over the cliff. You may, something may happen, I don't know. An illness, gunman, I don't know. Something may happen. But those who are in Christ are preserved. He preserves us. Now, he preserved our Lord and Savior as a child. And he, because he actually he has a plan that he, he's kind of very keenly interested in implementing in the world, which is what allows us to participate in the preservation I just talked about. But God, he has preservation over us. He will preserve us. You don't, you don't have to fear that. You know, it's Woody Allen who said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Okay. We all sort of have that sense of, well, this is a little bit scary, but the reality is we have a God who is bigger than the end of our life. We have a God who's bigger than our pain. We have a God who's bigger than our danger. And our Lord and Savior faced danger from childhood. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised when we face danger. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised when we face hard. He went through hard. He went through difficult. He went through danger. He went through pain. Danger is significant because it indicates the threat to both Satan and worldly powers that Jesus is, as well as it sets up the expectation that the Christian life will be marked by opposition. You realize that that's part of the deal. Part of the deal of the Christian life is there will be opposition to you. At some point, you will be opposed. Our Lord was opposed. This is actually something he directly says to his disciples at one point. The world hated me. <laughs> They're going to love you. Uh, that's my paraphrase of it. Okay? But he says, the world hated me. Same with you guys. You're going to be opposed. Because our Lord was opposed, because our Lord faced danger, we will be opposed. We will face danger. We will. And in Christ, it's okay because he will preserve us. Because he will preserve us. He promises preservation of his people. Number three, Jesus' early life is marked by fulfilled prophecy. Jesus' early life is marked by fulfilled prophecy. By fulfilled prophecy. Matthew 2, 23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, Nazareth, Nazarene. A little couple of notes on this. There is no clear specific prophecy in mind here. Okay? There's not a, a prophecy that literally says he will be called a Nazarene. The best we can guess on this is that it might be a reference to one or two passages out of Isaiah, maybe Psalm 22. Okay, and here's where that comes from, Nazareth and Nazarene. No specific prophecy seems to be in mind, although the possibilities are Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 3. In Isaiah 11, 1, it's related to the word branch. Okay? Isaiah 11 is the prophecy of uh, the, uh, there be, there's the root of Jesse and there will come a branch out of the root. And the branch is a reference, is a messianic reference to Jesus Christ. Jesse, of course, is the father of David. David became king after Saul, and the, the line of true kingship comes from David. Now, we've already looked a couple of times at how Jesus is in that legal line of David. 
Okay, so the idea of the, the word for branch in Isaiah 11 is uh, related to the word Nazareth or Nazarene. Okay, the other idea is Isaiah 53 verses 1 through 3. Nazarenes were generally a despised people. Okay, we see that later on when Andrew the brother of Simon Peter is telling Peter about Jesus and he's hearing about Jesus for the first time and he says, well, where, who is this guy? And he's from Nazareth. And, or, and, and there's kind of the response. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Because the expectation is those people are, you don't want to go there. That's the other side of the tracks. That is the other side. That's the place you don't, you don't, you don't go to Nazareth. That's Shady stuff happens in Nazareth, apparently. And so, Isaiah 53, talking about the great suffering servant, talks about how he was despised and rejected. So, the, collection, or the connection between Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 3, and he shall be called a Nazarene, has to do with him being despised has to do with him being despised. Psalm 22 is the other one that I mentioned. Psalm 22 is the psalm, if you know it, that has almost the clearest Old Testament description of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and it is eerily similar to the descriptions in the Gospels. Like, in some cases, it's like, okay, very clear. What, what, what they talked about in Psalm 22 is exactly what's happening to Jesus during the crucifixion. So, there's this general sense of the Old Testament talks about Jesus Christ. The Old Testament points us to Jesus Christ. Jesus is thoroughly connected to Old Testament prophecy throughout his life. According to one author by the name of Peter W. Stoner, in his book Science Speaks, the odds that anyone, even to this day, could fulfill all of the prophecies in the Old Testament that Christ fulfills are in the neighborhood of 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That is a 1 with 17 zeros behind it. Those are the odds that anyone is going to fulfill all of the prophecies in the Old Testament that Christ fulfills. Yes, your Old Testament matters. Okay? Uh, you know, there's, and I have to kind of side note here, because I'm an Old Testament nut. I love the Old Testament. We do not treat the Old Testament with enough respect. It's there for a purpose. It is the, the place where we first learn about God. It is the place where we first meet God. We first learn who He is. We first begin to see His character. We first begin to know what God is like in the Old Testament. And it's much misunderstood and often much aligned. The Old Testament is a gold mine of information about God and meeting Him and who He is. And by the way, we have this scripture in the New Testament that tells us don't despise the Old Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, or as God breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or mature and thoroughly furnished for every good work. Yes, the Old Testament matters. And one of the reasons the Old Testament matters is because without the Old Testament, you don't have a New Testament. Without the Old Testament, you don't have Jesus. You don't understand why Jesus is important. You don't see the prophecies that Jesus fulfills. The Old Testament is very important. It very much matters to our Christian life. Believers in Christ can be fully confident in the person, in the work, and in the teachings of Jesus Christ because of the events of his early life. Because of all of the angelic preservation and guidance, because of the crazy amounts of danger, the amount of threat he was under, and because of all of the fulfilled prophecy that we see in Jesus' life. Yes, you can trust this Jesus. Yes, the marks of his early life confirm his identity and confirm why we ought to be participants and recipients of his mission. Because he is who the Bible says he is. He is God in human flesh. He is God in human flesh come to save us. 
Come to redeem us. Come to restore. Come to repair. Come to set us on the right path. Come to teach. Come to correct. Come to love. You matter to God. How do you know you matter to God? Because he went through all of this for you. All of the danger, all of the heartache, all of the sorrow, all of the pain that Jesus went through, he went through for you because you are loved, because you are his treasured possession, because you matter to God, because you're adored and loved and he came after you. He doesn't stop the pursuit. He comes down, puts on human flesh, and runs after you. The only time you see God run is when he's running to you. He runs to us. He runs to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the early life of Jesus. We thank you that you guided and preserved him through the appearance and the announcement of angels. We thank you that you preserved him through tremendous danger so that he could grow and become our savior. We thank you that he fulfilled prophecy and proved and showed himself to be precisely who he claimed to be, a trustworthy, faithful savior. We thank you, God, how you have shown your great love to us in this. And we thank you that on account of all of this, we do not have to be shaken. We do not have to be fearful. We do not have to be afraid, but we can put our trust in you and we can make our home there too. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.